Matthew chapter 13 is where we will start this morning. If you have one of the Pew Bibles, it's on page 972. 972. We're going to do a little uh, theology this morning, and then hopefully we'll bring it all together and see how that theology will affect our feet, our hands, our lives as we live for the Lord. Um, Matthew chapter 13, 13 is a, a chapter chock full of uh, of parables, we're in part 10 of our series on parables, if you can believe it. That's wild. Part 10. Whew. They said we couldn't do it, but here we are. Okay. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 31. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than the other seeds, But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Verse 33. He spoke another parable to them that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three packs of flour until it was all leavened. Let's look at Mark chapter 4. Right after Matthew is Mark. And we're on page 998 if you have one of the Pew Bibles. Mark chapter 4. This parable of the mustard seed and the yeast is actually, or the leaven, is actually one of the parables that is repeated in all of the synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The parable of the sower is repeated in all three. And these parables are repeated in all three. The parable of the lost items from last week is only in Luke. But this parable is in all three of Matthew, Mark, Luke, And I think there's something significant to that because there's an important issue that Jesus is addressing through this parable. In Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, verse 30. And he said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God or by what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the soil, though it's smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. So the point of what we're getting at here is we're talking about something that's very small, mustard seeds, right? Seeds in general are small, but the mustard seed is a very small seed. And when planted in the ground and cultivated, it becomes a large tree. Uh, Matthew just told us that it's so large that the birds can rest in it, right? Birds don't make nests in in saplings. They make nests in strong and sturdy trees, and that's what Jesus is communicating here. And then uh, the yeast, uh, the leaven, it's it's small in its amount, but it just, it, 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 it's effectiveness in causing the bread to rise, or so I've heard. Uh, I get the beneficiary of eating it, but I've never done it, but we just trust Jesus on this one. That it, that it has a massive effect compared to its size. Verse 33, with many such parables, he was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to what? Yeah. Hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. So this is a good reminder of what parables are all about. Parables are these stories, these fictional stories that Jesus would tell that had A surface meaning, right? You put a seed in the ground, it grows a tree or grows fruit or put yeast in bread or dough and it it causes it to rise. But it has a deeper spiritual principle associated with it. And Jesus would teach in these things called parables to help separate those that were really, had ears that really worked, that listened to what he was saying and heard and listened to his words rather than the people that were there to just maybe get, I don't know, a free meal or like healed, right? Right? Two good things, but he wanted them to to come to him for his words and what he was saying. And so here we have some parables, and uh, these parables help to explain what he calls the kingdom of God. So as we look at these two parables this morning, the question we want to ask is, why is it that Jesus wants his disciples to hear, listen, and understand this parable? Why, Why does he want us to understand? It's a short one, right? This is a short one. Mustard seed turns into a tree. Leaven into the dough, it rises. That's it. Last week was 35 verses. We just got a couple here. I had to go to to Mark just to add time to the sermon. I'm going to Luke in a few minutes. 
But he tells us that these parables are to explain the kingdom of God. And let me just uh, take a minute and talk about that. The main message of Jesus, the main theme to what he spoke about was this concept called the kingdom of God. Can you say kingdom of God? Kingdom. The kingdom of God. And it was, it was uh, announcing its soon arrival and preparing people for its coming. The kingdom of God was the long-awaited day when God would establish his justice and his rule upon the earth again, like it was in the Garden of Eden. He's going to set all that was wrong after the fall of humanity right again, and it, it became known as this kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God was long associated, and this makes sense, it, it was clear that this kingdom would come when the king of that kingdom would come. Doesn't that make sense? All right. And this king of the kingdom was a man known as the Messiah or the anointed one. And so for hundreds of years, the people of God in the Old Testament had a, an expectation and a longing for this Messiah, for this anointed one, but they didn't know who it was. They didn't know his name, right? We look back and we know, well, Jesus is the Messiah, but they didn't know that. And so, so much of the Gospels is unpacking the question of whether or not he's the one. And so he would tell these stories. And so there was a great buildup to this day, a longing, an expectation, a frustration, and a hope. And so the Jewish nation was looking for this Messiah to come and usher in this kingdom age. You can read the Gospels, I hope you do, and, and as you're looking through, you'll see these exchanges where people are like, are you the Messiah? Are you the coming uh, are you the coming one, or should we wait for someone else? That's a great question to ask. Jesus is coming, doing miracles, he's healing, he's talking about the kingdom of God, and they're like, okay, question. Thank you, I, I know I couldn't walk a second ago, but now I can, but I just got to ask you a quick question before I go leap, leap home. Are you the Messiah? Are you the anointed one? Are you the expected one? Are you the king of the kingdom? Because if he was, that speaks to something much bigger than just a temporal healing. We're talking about the restoration and the, the age to come where there's no more sickness. Are you the one? They would ask that often. It was a great question to ask. His disciples would even have interchanges with him where Jesus, you know, as they're walking to their next village, would be like, let me ask you guys a question. Who do people think that I am? Imagine being asked that, right? Who, who do you think that I am? And, and they would say, well, some people are saying this, some people are saying this, and, and they would have this conversation. And so Jesus would heal and teach and do miracles, and the anticipation for his ascent to this, this throne would grow. In fact, so much of the story of the Gospels, the New Testament stories about Jesus, involves his journey towards Jerusalem, and with each step towards Jerusalem, which is where this king is going to rule, the expectation would grow. Look at Luke. I, I told you I would bring Luke in, right? There's Luke's version of this same parable, and then Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? How can I illustrate it? It is like a tiny mustard seed that a man planted in the garden. It grows and becomes a tree, and the birds make their nests in its branches. And he also asked, what else is the kingdom of God like? It is like yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast and three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Next verse, Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he went, always pressing on towards where? Jerusalem. So Jesus' ministry is not just nebulous. Oh, let's go over here. Hey, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, we're going to Gap. But he was moving towards Jerusalem because you know what? That's where the king of the kingdom is going to be and come. So he's talking about the kingdom. He's doing the works of the kingdom. He's fulfilling prophecies about the kingdom. And he's walking towards the city where the king's going to rule from. It'd be a pretty good guess to say he's the guy and it's coming soon coming soon. Try to put yourself in that, in that world. And so then later in Jesus's ministry, listen to this interesting exchange in, in chapter 19 of Luke, verse 11 on the wall here. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near where? And they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he's almost in Jerusalem. And he's about to tell him another parable. Actually, in this case, and we're not looking at that parable today, but the purpose is almost in a sense to put the brakes on a little bit because there were some other things that were going to happen. So in light of all of this, the kingdom of God is still what God's purpose and plan uh, to be realized is. God didn't abandon his original plan. 
Jesus will come back one day. This is what the Bible teaches, what Christians believe, that Jesus is going to return visibly and bodily to this earth as a, a, a warrior, as a political and military conqueror. There's not going to be much opposition. He's just going to come and bring victory and take over the world on behalf of his Father. So, that would be okay. We sang Days of Elijah today, and, and we're all freaking out, right? Right? <laughs> In my consciousness of that song, this is how I hear that song. Behold, he comes. Woo! Because every time we sing that, my mother-in-law goes, woo! <laughs> you know why? Because she wants it to come too, right? And we're longing for this and we're singing this. But can we be honest this morning? We are not living in the kingdom of God. The church is not the kingdom of God. Uh, oops, it didn't work out, so let's be the... It's not something, the warm, fuzzy feeling in your heart. We're not living in what the Bible says the kingdom of God is going to be. So we're in this weird place between Jesus coming and doing some kingdom things and him not coming back yet to fulfill all of it. And here we are. And so Jesus is going to speak on this issue a couple of times in his ministry. And in fact, he's going to describe the coming of this kingdom like a mustard seed and like leaven. Because what's happening when Jesus first comes on the scene is something begins. Something that had never been seen before is starting to happen and occur. We're talking miracles. We're talking about power. We're talking about a, a confrontation of Satan and the evil one and, and, and a, a powerful authoritative teaching of truth that had never been seen before because Jesus is here. So something's happening, but also something still is to come. And so Jesus tells us in this parable for today that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And though it's the smallest of seeds, it ultimately becomes the greatest of trees. And it's like leaven. The kingdom of God is like leaven. It gets put in to the dough. And though it's a small amount, it ends up having a massive effect. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed and like Leaven. So at the heart of what Jesus is teaching is that the kingdom of God is, 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 there's a part of it that's beginning with Jesus coming, but the bigness of it is still to come. Does that make sense? Everybody doing all right? Look at your neighbor and say, you doing okay there, brother, sister? You doing okay? All right. Good. I bet you can relate to this truth, that sometimes the little things in life are some of the most important things. Isn't that true? It's the little things. They seem insignificant. They seem unknown. Sometimes they seem unseen. Sometimes little things in our lives are hard. Sometimes they're easy. But it's the little things sometimes that ultimately make up uh, the important things in life sometimes, right? We, we uh, in our culture, in our tradition, we... Uh, indicate that we want to be committed to uh, a, a woman for the rest of our lives when a man gets down on one knee and has a what in his hand? I'm glad nobody said like a prenuptial agreement or something like that. <laughs> That's right, a ring, right? And it could be big, small, right? Some, some of my brothers, we, we chose like Big, huge diamonds that look really, re they look like the color of that lamp right there, right? But they're big, but they're yellow. And then some of us chose these little, little tiny ones, but they're perfectly clear, right? And it turns out a lot of those smaller diamonds are the ones that cost more. And that little ring, that little tiny insignificant in size thing is a symbol of a commitment forever. There's a ring exchange in the ceremony, right? Whether or not you spend thousands of dollars or tens of dollars, it's, it's that small thing that has a big significance. And so Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of God and its coming is going to start small and then get big. It's like a mustard seed. And Jesus and, and Scripture in general tell us a lot about these small things that seem insignificant and how important they are. Things like mustard seed, things like leaven, things like children and shepherds and widows, small and insignificant in our society, but big in the eyes of God. Things like prayer, things like encouragement, things like calling someone, things like showing up, things like listening. 
small and insignificant, but really mean a lot, don't they, church? They do. Conversations, reading, calling. And so these parables are going to tell us about the size, and the size in this case starts out small, the time, the duration may be long, and the growth is large. This is uh, something comparable to a mustard seed in my hand right here. Can you see that? I just, I just dropped it. Dan Roy, let's see how good that zoom is. I keep dropping it. All right, so here, here, here's what I'll do. I got a bunch of them on my finger here. Okay, look how tiny that is. All right. Now, in the parable Jesus is, is, is teaching, he's talking about something that starts this small, but then you know how big it gets? I'd like everybody to stand up. Let's try to get a look here out this window. Get the blood flowing. I was going to go out there and bring everybody, so just trust this is mercy. Okay? You see this big tree right here? Right on the retaining wall? Can everybody see that? All right, this side of the room, duck down a little bit. You see how big that tree is? That tree has been growing for decades. It's huge. It goes, it goes higher than this building. And you know what that tree started with? Just a little seed. And it took time, and it took cultivating, or maybe not. It's just what God causes his creation to do, that a little seed may be insignificantly placed there. Maybe the farmer that used to own this land went out one day and said, I want to plant a tree right there. Or maybe a bird hit something, and a seed which was dangling off of its leg fell, and that tree grew. These seeds are very insignificant. You know how much, uh, how I can show you how insignificant they are? <laughs> Pam is not here. <laughs> I, I don't even care that these seeds are on the ground, because you know what? Nobody in this room is going to be able to go around and collect all the seeds and put them back in this bowl. Not even you, brother. Not even you. <laughs> I feel like we're in a revival. If the seed falls on you, 20 years of blessing. Insignificant. And Jesus says that is how the kingdom of God starts. It's smaller than the other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so big that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Let's go now and look at two places about what this big full grown tree will look like. We're going to go to the book of Isaiah. Good thing there's not this week we're not doing the parable of the horseshoes. <laughs> The parable of the millstone. Okay, Isaiah chapter 2, in the Pew Bible, it's on page 685. This is what, a little bit of what the kingdom of God is going to look like when it's fully grown into this tree. Isaiah chapter 2, page 685 in the Black Pew Bible. And this is what it's going to be like. It says in verse 2, It will come about that in the last days... The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And many people will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we will walk in his paths. for the law will go forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and, they, and will render decisions for many people. They will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. This little snapshot of what the fully grown tree is going to be like is a time where all of the nations are going to come and worship the Lord. You're going to invite your friends and your neighbors perhaps to come and celebrate on Easter. And they're going to be like, eh, I don't know, I got to put the ham in. In that day, the whole earth will be coming to learn and know the ways of God. There will be no carpooling problems. There'll be enough room for everybody to go and seek him and know him. And the effects of his rule will be so great that throughout the world, this is something bigger than just nice imagery, throughout the world, the weapons of warfare are going to be turned into the tools of agriculture, 
Rather than fighting, we'll be farming. This is what is going to happen in that day. Clearly, we're not in that moment now. Though we demonstrate the peace of God with each other now and reconciliation between uh, men and women and the races and, and all the rest happen when people come to know Christ. But it's not like this. We have places where there's violence and terrorism and, and trouble. And, but in that day, when the tree grows to its full capacity, this is what it'll be look, look like. Let's go to one other place, chapter 11 of the same book, Isaiah, chapter 11, page 694, if you're following with the Pew Bible. Isaiah 11, this is talking about the ruler, this Messiah, this king who will rule this kingdom. It says uh, in verse 1 that a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse and a branch from the root will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see nor make a decision by what his ears hear. We're talking about the, a governmental ruler who will rule the world based on the spirit of God. Based on not what they see or what they hear or what they think or who's funding their campaign or what promises they made on the, on the stump when they were out campaigning for the job. No, we're talking about someone whose heart and perspective is driven by the Spirit of the Lord alone. No injustice, no favoritism, no corruption. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make decisions by what his ears hear. Verse 4, but with righteousness he will judge the poor. He will decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. And look how pervasive this rule will be that even verse 6, the, the wolf and the lamb will dwell together and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little boy will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. A nursing child will play on the hole of a cobra. And the wean child will put his hand on the viper's den. We get all bent out of shape when the pacifier falls on the ground. <laughs> We're talking about a peace and a, and, a, and a restoration that is personified by little children being able to play where there might be snakes and holes of cobras. Verse 9, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Here's a great summary statement of the fully grown tree. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. People, waters don't cover the sea. Waters are the sea. It's everywhere in the sea the water is. That's what it's going to be like on this planet when the kingdom of God comes and this righteous king, the anointed Messiah, comes to rule like a flood of the glory and knowledge of the Lord. No more violence, no more hurting, no more opposition to God's people. Salvation, restoration, healing, victory, a, a, a defeat of death, a defeat of, of the devil, righteousness, peace, joy forever and ever. So that's why when we sing, Behold, He comes, we go, Woo! Because the world we live in, even on his best days, doesn't even compare to this. And I hope in your heart and your soul, even if you are not a Christ follower, you have a longing for a day like this. Where the people you love don't get sick. Where people don't die. Where you don't have pain when you get up in the morning. Where you don't have to deal with the frustration of, of, of the relational conflicts that seem to plague us every single day and every single hour. And those things will all be done away with when this tree is fully grown. But right now, it's not fully grown. Right now, we're in mustard seed, mustard seed stage. And so now, though the kingdom of God has, has, in a sense, begun to work in this world, it's not like this. Can I get anybody to confirm that with an amen? amen? It's not like this. It's hard. Life is hard, even for the Christians. I've had multiple conversations uh, with people in the last two weeks where they have said that I feel like life wasn't as hard for me when I wasn't a Christian. That life is harder. 
since I started following Christ. Not all the time, but there are moments when it seems like it's harder. And, and that's true. You know why? Because if you've begun to follow this King Jesus, you've, instead of just going with the flow on the lazy river that headed off to a waterfall, you're now swimming upstream. And you know what? You get tired doing that sometimes. And so now the kingdom of God at work today is in its seed form. And here's the way that this mustard seed is at work and this, this yeast is at work in the dough of creation. There is a subversive movement at work in the world where the king of the kingdom is on the move, gathering and calling subjects to himself. He has sent ambassadors ahead of his arrival to announce his arrival as eminent and offering terms of peace to those who are not a part of his kingdom. And those who surrender to his authority are given a great gift and a tremendous resource to do his work. And so this mustard seed stage of the kingdom in the lives of the people of the king, he begins to show his power by shaping their hearts and lives to be like his. They begin to look like his people, a royal people, and are commissioned by him to begin training which will be used for his kingdom purposes. It says on the wall here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that anyone that is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against him, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we, the new people of God, are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is someone that represents their nation in a foreign place, and they get to wear the sash. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So the, the kingdom of God is not here but something began when Jesus came and he is, he is searching and longing for a people who will join with him to be a part of this kingdom leaven, mustard seed sort of work. When Jesus was here, it says in the Gospels, Matthew 12, 28, it says, but if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When Jesus would confront the works of the devil, he equated that to the kingdom of God being at work amongst that group of people. So the world we're living in right now, we're not living in the kingdom of God. We're not living in the time when everything wrong with the world is right. But we're also not living in a time where we only have defeat every single day. Where we are by ourselves and alone to try to fend for ourselves in this life. Jesus would confront the devil, and when he would confront demons and evil spirits that were afflicting people, either in sickness or in mental torment or in other, other ways, he said, that's the kingdom of God coming into that, into that world, into that sphere. Luke 17, having been questioned by who? The Pharisees, as to when the kingdom of God was coming, again, that question that came up often, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. So when he, the king, was there, it was beginning this kingdom work. And so the Pharisees, right? Remember the people that were uh, studying the scriptures and looking for that day to all be fulfilled according to the scriptures? They say, when is the kingdom of God coming? And he says, you're not going to be able to even see when it comes. That's an interesting thing to say to somebody. Look what he says in the very next breath. And he said, to who? So the Pharisees, he said, you're not going to be able to see and observe what it's going to be like. And then he turns to his disciples, the people listening to his words, and he said, the days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there, look here, don't go away and do not run after them. For just like lightning, when it flashes out of one part of the sky and shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. What does he tell his disciples? He says, you're going to see it. It's going to be loud and clear, like lightning flashing from one end of the heaven to the others. I mean, when lightning shows up, 
Is it obvious? It's very loud. It's very bright. And if you're in the wrong spot, you really know. So you see, the Pharisees that were looking for it to come a certain way at a certain time, they weren't even going to be able to see it. But Jesus said to the people that are his disciples, you're going to begin to see it at work now like leaven and like a mustard seed. And in that day, you're going to see the tree fully grown. So keep, keep looking. Keep your eyes focused on that, he would tell his disciples. So the kingdom of God uh, is near but not here. It's present, but still future. Some of its blessings are here, but many are not. Some of its power is here, but much of it's not. There is a joy of what's to come, but a longing for what's not here yet. And that's where we live. We are living in this mustard seed age where something has begun, but not everything has come yet. Does that make sense? Maybe this not, not ever something you thought you had to sort out. Like, okay, it's not here yet. That's obvious. But if you read the scripture, they had an expectation that when the king came, the kingdom came. We are looking back going like, well, yeah, of course. Like, why didn't it happen? Well, Jesus had to die for our sins. And then he's coming back and he's going to preach to all the Gentiles through the disciples. And yeah, 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 I get it. But this would be a major problem for the people sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his teaching. Because when the king came, the kingdom comes. And the king was there, and the kingdom didn't come. And so a lot of people stopped following Jesus as a result of that because they wanted this full coming of the kingdom. And what they misunderstood was that there was another piece of fulfillment of this prophecy that had to be done. Not just for the king to come and reign and rule, but he came to sacrifice his own life so that people could actually be in the kingdom with him. And that was the part that people were missing. And that's what Jesus came to do. And then he will come in that day. So let's try to bring it all together and think about how this affects us as the mustard seed people. I wish I had more mustard seed I could throw at you. <laughs> Tim, could you pick them up and bring them up? <laughs> I would imagine that it may have been disappointing to hear that the kingdom of God was coming first like a mustard seed and then later as the tree. Because I imagine that many of us in this room long for the tree. We long for the bread to be ding and taken out of the oven. And, and we're at the putting the, putting the yeast in and, and getting it to rise. We're at the putting the mustard seed in the ground. And, and so uh, we live in this... Uh, this time that we want the full thing to come, but we're still living here. And I think another um, truth that this mustard seed principle tells us is that even though it's, it, it's in a small form, the fact that, it, that it's even here at all is very significant. And it, and it makes me think that, that the small things that I do for God and his kingdom that may, sing, that may seem insignificant, are actually a big deal. The small things that you and I do now for the kingdom of God and for our king that seem small and insignificant are like that mustard seed. That though it may start out small, it, it's going to get big. And here's what I mean by that. There are some very small and seemingly insignificant things that the people of God are called to do now as part of being part of his kingdom citizens here in this world. And sometimes those things seem really small and insignificant. But in the kingdom of God, there is no such thing as something's too small to God. When you, when you do something seemingly insignificant and small like pray, that makes a big impact in the spiritual realm, in light of what you're praying for. And here's the, here's the problem that we sometimes have. Sometimes we don't see it right away. But it's a mustard seed. And so it seems insignificant. I pray. I had a very difficult week this past week. I felt oppressed. And so I'm fighting to pray, and I'm just barely getting out words like, God help me. 
And it seems like nothing changes because all I do is just go, God help me. But it's a mustard seed. It's small and it may not turn into the big tree overnight, but it's not insignificant. Because the things of the kingdom of God, even the smallest and seemingly insignificant thing, are big things and will grow and produce the spiritual fruit that God promises them to produce. And so the devil wants to talk us out of the small things of our faith and of our life. He wants to talk us out of praying with someone. He wants to talk us out of engaging with someone and and reaching out to someone or showing love to someone. Because after all, what can I do to help? What am I going to say that's going to change their circumstances? What, what prayer am I going to pray? I mean, after all, they've been on the prayer list for how many years? And, and it doesn't seem like it's working. But it's a mustard seed. It's yeast. And it's got to be planted for something to grow. And so we don't plant these kingdom mustard seed things, these small and seemingly insignificant things in our lives. It's never going to grow. If you think prayer is insignificant because as soon as you say amen, everything hasn't changed in the lives of the other people that you're praying for that you have no control over, and so you don't do it, you're missing what Jesus is trying to teach us, this kingdom principle. That sometimes things start small, but that's how it must start if it's going to grow for his glory. Prayer is never insignificant. Reading the Bible is never insignificant. You open up the Bible and you read one verse and you don't even get it. It's all a bunch of names and it's a bunch of crazy stuff and and cities. And and then you realize you weren't even reading the Bible. You're reading the table of contents and you're just like, oh my gosh. (laughs) That might be insignificant, but keep turning and you'll get to the part. You see, the things of the kingdom of God start small. They start small. They start simple. They start hidden. And so if if, if you have an expectation of the the bam, boom, entertainment thing that that the world is trying to tell us, you're going to miss the thing that God is trying to work and grow and do in this world. It starts small. In the kingdom of God, the little things are the big things. In the kingdom of God, the little things are are the big things. In the kingdom of God, the little things are the big things, and I need God to help me really believe that. Because I don't always believe that. When we have difficulty, we had a men's fellowship yesterday, and we could have gone around, and we could have just had one one guy represent the whole group because it seemed like everybody that shared was talking about the same thing. You know, we come out of these men's retreats and these men's weekend and we're ready to take over the world for God and we've got this sober mindset, right? We talked about not living a Christian life that's like a cruise ship, but one that looks like a battleship. And man, don't you know that the devil just hammers away at his people sometimes? He just, he just hammers away at God's people sometimes. He brings difficulty in their lives. He, he causes conflict. He, he, he brings pressure. He brings uh, a, a lazy spirit, a, a stupor. He, maybe you get sick coming out of something and it takes you time to recover and the things that you want to do, or maybe you get busy or maybe new things come into your life that you're not ready for yet and it, it can take you out and it can mess with you. It's those little things that get us back on track in those times. God help me. Hello, brother, sister, yeah, I don't even feel like praying. Can you pray for me, please? Here's what's going on. This may seem insignificant, but I'm believing by faith that God can begin to grow something here. The little things are the big things. Jesus is going to say to his disciples a a, a very shocking, uh, shocking thing in Matthew 17. He says, truly I say to you, If you have faith the size of a what? You will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. Now, he wasn't talking about a literal mountain. And I know that because I tried so many times when I was a kid 
looking at the mountains of New York. I believe, I believe, I believe. I'm still there. Believe, I believe, I believe. But this is a figure about the big things, the seemingly unconquerable, huge things in our life, like a mountain. And he says that if you have faith just the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. He says in Luke, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, another big tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. If only the people of God would believe what their master taught, that if you have faith like a mustard seed, those things in our life, those obstacles can be removed. But it's like a mustard seed. So it may not happen uh, overnight. It may not be the size. It might be the duration because you put a seed in the ground and it takes time. But you got to put that seed in the ground for anything to grow down the road. And he says, if we would just have faith the size of a mustard seed, nothing, we, nothing would be impossible. And we don't believe that. Because we're looking for something bigger to do the job. If only we had a bulldozer. If only we had dynamite. If only we had, you know, a, one of those uh, ball things, the, the, the demo things that I clearly don't know. That's what we want. But he said that the power to get rid of the mountains isn't in the wrecking ball, isn't in the bulldozer. It's in faith. As big as a mustard seed. The answers to the questions that you have in your life, the answers might be as big as a mustard seed, and you might be looking for something bigger than that, and you'll miss it. Because there's no small things in God's kingdom. You mean the answer is praying about it? You mean the answer is uh, uh, sacrificially giving in that way? You mean the answer is showing up? You mean the answer is staying faithful? You mean the answer is responding to the text message? You mean the answer is going to that person's house with this small, seemingly insignificant meal? You mean the answer is uh, texting a brother, calling a brother, reading this book, uh, going to this place, reaching out to that person? Yes, that's what it is. It's seemingly insignificant. But God has said that these small things invested in his kingdom will have a big, big return. If we just had faith, the size of a mustard seed, nothing would be impossible. And it's no wonder why the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. Because whatever is smaller than a mustard seed, that's the size of my faith. <laughs> Let's close in Galatians, page 1168, chapter 6. So the kingdom of God it's like a mustard seed. It's like leaven, and it's, it's been planted, and it's working, and it will grow into that big tree. And in the meantime, we keep that faith. Galatians chapter 6. I got it on the wall here. We can save the time. Paul writes this. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So let us not lose heart in doing good. We're not in the kingdom of God yet, people. But we're not where we used to be. So don't give up when things are hard. Don't give up when the tree isn't fully grown, when the birds start to fly by and they can't yet rest in the branches, when the world around us is evil and, and, and corrupt and devastating, or there, there's conflict or there's pressure or there's problems. Don't give up. Don't quit. Get the help you need. Do those small things that are seemingly insignificant, like pray, God help me. Open up the Bible. Ask the Lord to come bring deliverance. Get a spirit-filled brother or sister to minister to you, to speak into your life. Show up where people are talking about these things. Don't grow weary. Do not lose heart in doing good. 
For in due time, what are those next two words? I'd say it like this. We will. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time, we will reap if we do not grow weary. Father, increase our faith. Implant a, a new faith in my heart, God, that can believe even when I don't see. That can believe you're working even when I don't see it on the outside, God. That I can believe you're working and you are bringing deliverance. You are bringing victory for your people. Even though it doesn't seem like it on the outside, Lord, let us not quit. Let us not grow weary. Let us hold on to that great promise and that great hope that you will grow this tree. And this tree, your kingdom, will fill the earth. It'll be like the waters that cover the sea. Every inch of this planet will be covered in your glory and in your knowledge. And Lord, though we don't see that, we long for it. And I pray that in the meantime, while we wait, That we would not grow weary, that we would not lose heart, that we would wait on you and trust you and rely on you and depend on you. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Your rod and your staff are there to comfort me, and I know you are with me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.